start. We've got a presentation which we're going to use here. Okay, so now we're going to make the shift to go from um, SQLize to modular. In the process of doing it, let's also talk a little bit about database design and how these schemas get set up because even though they're, they're quite different, some of the same principles hold up when you're uh, using, uh, when you're designing your schema for Mongo, which really doesn't have a schema, but we're going to use something called Mongoose to create that schema. So if we sort of think about, you know, the idea of, in terms of a database, uh, the, the, the biggest uh, sort of takeaway from you know, what, what ends up making a database or what you end up using as a database is that it's really something is persistent, right? I mean, that's how we sort of think about it. And the fact that, um, the fact that it's persistent and there's some I.O., right, this ends up um, adding a level of complexity. Like, we, didn't, we wouldn't, when we start thinking about how we started with our Twitter JS and the idea that we just had this data that was sitting in memory, Right? We did that when we were first learning Express, but then all of a sudden when we have that same kind of data structure, but we put it inside of a database, now we're interacting with something that's persistent as a result of the fact it's asynchronous. From there we end up getting into promises, and that sort of thing. So, you know, where when we end up, you know, the, the big thing about databases, and you can maybe say that a file, comma delimited, file is some form of a database, is that there's some persistence somewhere. So we're going to end up looking at MongoDB. Now, again, I, I think one of the, there's definitely use cases for, uh, for MongoDB, but it's not a cure -all. And I think what is sometimes pretty common is that you'll set things up with MongoDB because it's very, very easy to set things up and, and get uh, get data in there and to make modifications to it. But as your application grows, if there is really a relational structure to your data, more often than not, there is a relational structure. A lot of times you'll end up migrating. But you know, this is, I think a lot of people that do uh, JavaScript development, so the node stack, Mean works out well because you have this acronym and it's fairly easy to go and set up. Although we looked at SQLize today and it, you know a couple of lines of code and we had two models that were related to each other. So there's really not all that much of a difference. So you know just a little bit of history. Um, you know this is the M and the Mean stack. Uh, you know this was founded you know seven years ago and you know the, you'll get varying opinions on this. There are some people that have worked with. You know, Mongo, that'll tell you they're never touching it again. There's some people that, that love it. Um, there, there's, there are particular situations where it tends to, tends to work out a little bit better. Um, so th one of the reasons why it works out pretty well for uh, JavaScript development is that the data is really stored in the form of JavaScript. Um, there, there's a... It's, it's actually stored in something called Bison or Bison, which is a superset. So it basically is uh, uh, JSON notation, which again looks like JavaScript, looks like a JavaScript object literal, but it's not quite a JavaScript object literal. Um, you see that first of all, all of your keys are quoted with uh, with strings. Um, with uh, uh, BSON, there's just some other data types. So you have the ability to store um, binary data, which you can't do with JSON. There's a date type, which JSON uh, doesn't use. So, but in the end, I, I think one of the reasons why it's, uh, it's the same language. It's not like you have to use a learn, uh, learn a new language, although look, you can make with the case with SQLize that you don't have to use a, a language either. But the, you know, the fact is, is that it, it, it's pretty simple to take your data from 
Mongo and turn it into JavaScript that ends up getting used in your application. And the reason for that is that it's stored pretty much in JavaScript object notation. So the, in terms of getting used to some of the syntax, um, the, the Mongo equivalent of a table is going to be a collection. Collections don't have schemas like tables have schemas. Um, so that means that uh, you can have these items that are in a collection, and the items don't have to be the same. You can put whatever you want to in a collection. There's no restrictions at the database level. It's very, very open, and the fact that it's pretty open to doing things gives it some, uh, some advantages uh, that, again, might make you end up looking at it for certain uh, types of tasks. So when we end up thinking of uh, if collections are tables, okay, uh, the equivalent of rows are going to be documents. So each piece of data in a Mongo collection is called a document. And again, they're basically just these JSON objects, these associative arrays. That's how they end up getting put in. That's how you end up taking them out. And each document, unlike a row in a table, each document can be totally different. Right? You can put whatever, whatever you can take a JavaScript object and put it inside of a, a collection. So, I mean, for instance, here, you know, and you, we'll, we'll end up using this, but here is a, um, so I've got, let me quit out of this so you can actually see me go into it. So if you have Mongo installed, you could open it up just by typing in Mongo. And the idea of creating a database in Mongo is really simple. Just by using the database, you could create, so I could say, uh, use my silly database, and it ends up creating that database. Now, right now, this database is empty. If I say show collections, it doesn't end up showing me anything. But if I, there's a, a, there's a value in this Mongo shell that lets you get access to your collections. It's the DB object. So the DB object allows you to specify, um, if I say db.users, insert, I could go in here and I could say, you know, name professor. And it'll end up inserting that record in the collection. It will actually not only insert it into the collection, it'll create the collection. So if I end up saying show collections now, I'll end up seeing that. And if I say db.find, uh, db.users.find, I'll get back that user. I could go in here, you can add whatever you want, db.users.insert. Who are count five? There's absolutely no schema that's associated with that. And you could do things, you know, there, there are some things that will look at like db.users.find. You know, I could say where name professor. And I'll find that object, or I could say db.users.find, where count is greater than four, and it'll end up finding that second record. But if I said <coughs> six, all right, it won't end up finding anything. So. The, the, the big takeaway there is that you can stick whatever you want to into these collections, and there's a language for querying these collections. So, again, the documents themselves are not all alike, like the rows of a table are. Um, so just sort of comparing these three ways of storing data, right? In Excel, we've got an Excel file, SQL, we've got a database. Mongo, also a database. Excel, you have a worksheet. You have a table. In SQL, you have a collection. Um, and, you know, rows are the same in Excel and SQL, but you've got a document in Mongo. 
Um, there's also the idea of putting indexes in Mongo the same way that you have indexes in SQL. And again, the sort of saw this before. The takeaways that indexes are great in terms of finding data, but indexes have to be maintained. So sometimes they are, they'll make a process slower in terms of inserting data or adding data where indexes have to be, have to be modified. I should say more of sort of updating data. It's a little bit, a little bit more of an issue. Um, so, hey, yeah. One question about that slide. So, is there a difference between field and column? They just call two different things. I mean, it, it, there's a difference in the sense that you know, columns are a field is fields could be different in different documents within the same collection. But when we think of a field, you think of that JavaScript object notation. Right, where I said count is equal to something, the field in that case, you just call fields on those documents. Again, it's really just an associative or array with keys and values. You know, it's again, you're storing, you're, you're storing JSON data in these collections. Um, so, some terms that you'll end up seeing here, you don't have, there's no built in joins with. Uh, with Mongo. So one of the, so, you know, part of that, uh, part of the thing that happens is that you don't have a re an easy way of things being related. And the way that you can end up sort of joining on things is by linking. So for instance, if you had a collection called categories, right, where each category had an ID, and you had a collection called um, products, right, where a product has a category, then you could say, yeah, I'm gonna set it up so that my category ID in each of my products ends up corresponding to an actual category in the category table. Or you could embed things and say, hey, look, here's my product and my product has a category. And you can have another uh, JavaScript object for that category. And there's advantages of doing it you know, different ways. I mean, you could make Mongo feel very relational, and then sort of kind of defeats the purpose of it being Mongo, or you can take advantage of doing things like embedding, but then sometimes if you want to handle your database like a relational database, it might be a little bit tricky to get at the data that you want. So we'll, we'll talk about the difference between embedding and linking. Um, there's still some aggregation in Mongo, so you have the ability to basically look at this collection and being able to count things or being able to find the maximum value in a collection, that sort of thing. Obviously, you could filter by passing in this other, other object. Um, again, the language is a little bit different. We saw that when I did the find, you know, here I just pass in an object as opposed to SQLize, where when you do a find, you have to put the where there, and that's the object that's, that's doing the, that you're using for the filtering. Um, so, some of the stuff we looked at, right? You're, you're, you're familiar with the SQL. We saw this db.users.insert. This becomes the document that gets inserted. db.users.find. db.users.find with where clause. Uh, being able to use a collection and then being able to go and sort the collection on a column or different columns. So, again, stuff that you end up doing with SQL. You can also do it with, uh, with Mongo, but again, I, this is, I think, part of the takeaway why it's popular with JavaScript because, again, it's, you're using it and you're writing JavaScript to interact with the database as opposed to writing SQL. Now, again, you know, we could use JavaScript to interact with the database when we use SQLize, but under the cover is it still is SQLize. Well, here, under the cover is it, it's JavaScript. So uh, in terms of what the strength is, in terms of um, Mongo, right? You can actually mix things up. Um, so part of this is that if you're working with a database and you want to do things like adding columns to the database, if you're using a SQL database, there are big ways of doing it. We, we ran sync, which wipes out our database and, and adds new fields. Um, and that's fine in a development environment. With Mongo, it's very, very easy to basically say, hey, look, we decided that these objects are going to have a new field. 
You don't have to make any changes to the database. You just specify every time that I put a piece of data in here, I'm going to add it as property. I'll add a priority or something along those lines. So in terms of like, um, if you're sort of in the planning stages and you don't know exactly what your um, objects are going to look like that your business is modeling, they become a bit more flexible than if you end up using SQL. Um, so it's also very good if you're capturing unstructured information. So you say, hey, look, I'm capturing this data, um, you know, but I don't exactly know what my keys and values are. Your keys and values can end up being, being very dynamic. So there's, there's certain applications that it ends up working well for. Um, some of these have to do with, with data types that are in the application. But for things like logging, where you're just putting stuff in there, you, you, know, you might not be updating as much. It ends up you know, working out to be uh, pretty fast and some other uh, uh, application designs or, 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 or some other use cases that you have here. Um, so th th there's also this idea of, uh, certain data types, so by default there is a data type which is, uh, I've never used it, but there's a geospatial data type which could end up coming in pretty handy for uh, web applications. Again, you have, you know, phones and laptops can, uh, you know, report their location, so you can do searches based on location and that sort of thing. You know, the, the fact that it's built basically to scale really well, and if you sort of think about it, if there aren't constraints that are on the database, it kind of makes sense that it's fairly easy to scale. Um, and the fact that uh, you know you could you could pretty easily make copies of things, separate things out, separate collections out, okay, which is not that easy to do with a SQL database. You ever had to? I mean, even very very. Uh, big applications where there's a lot of users, you might have a lot of processes that are handling the web requests, but there's one database that it's using. Because it's just sort of a pain for a, a SQL database to keep a database <coughs> in sync. But this is one of the things that Mongo was built with. And again, the fact that you don't have these restrictions on the database makes it easy to basically make copies of it or say, look, I'm going to, you know, put these rows over here and put these rows over there. And this is something that's built into the design of the database. Can you expand on that a little more? Like, so if you had, let's say, a ton of user records, uh, why is it easier to copy those than a big table of, you know, SQL records? And, and after you split those, um, why would it be easier to maintain two in, in this case? Um, I, I don't know offhand. I mean, again, my guess is it has to do with the fact, I, I would think that it just has to be the fact that it's just less restrictive on the data. It's just basically collections of these objects. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. I think part of it is maybe that just scaling was built in to the process when it was developed. I mean, it was basically part of it, I think, was developed. Mongo, it's Mongo because it's humongous, right? So it was built with scaling in mind, which probably is not the first order of business with traditional relational databases. But I, I have to think that a lot of it just has to do with the fact that if you don't have those restrictions on things like where you're not necessarily worrying about um, foreign keys and how the records end up relating to each other, uh, that that has something, something to do with it. So um, again, another advantage, we spoke about this, is that you, ha you, you have this, you don't have this impedance, meaning that if you're running a SQL query and you pull your, your data out and you want to put it in the form of JavaScript, you have to have a way of doing that. And here, it's stored as JavaScript, so it's easy to get it out as JavaScript. So in terms of weaknesses, right, it's very, it doesn't have any transaction support. Um, I say that it's tough to control the integrity of the database at the data level because there's not really integrity to be, begin with, right? It's not like you say, look, the only thing that could end up going into this collection is this type of object and these uh, fields and this object are going to be required. I mean, it's, it's, it's incredibly loose, right? So when that happens, you run into a scenario where 
you know, you could get data that doesn't make sense for your application. Now, again, with a, with a, a SQL database, there's all kinds of things that you could do. I mean, in our example, we could have put a restriction on our database to say, hey, look, our, um, our tweet has to have a minimum value, you know, of this, or um, don't, don't accept null values, it can't be too long, all these things that we could end up doing. Now, granted, we might, we'd get a database error if we, in, our, in our UI, but our data would never end up getting contaminated, right? It would be impossible at the database level for that to happen. Um, so you don't really have that, and, and you don't have the ability to really support real relationships with, you know, between tables. So if you went in and you were working for a bank and you said, well, we could switch over to Mongo, uh, they probably throw you out pretty fast, right? I mean, you're not going to use it for anything that really needs to have that tight transactional support. It's fast, it's scalable, okay? But there are definitely some, some weaknesses with it. So again, some of this other, uh, the, the, the trade-offs that you, that you go through. Um, so you know, look, I think the, the takeaway is that if you were, you try to shoehorn relational data where you want to make sure that it's normalized and you don't want to have data that ends up repeating itself, um, then probably you're going to end up being better off with a relational database. So let's talk a little bit about Mongo in particular, right? We have this whole idea of these CRUD operations. We want to be able to create, we want to be able to read. We want to be, be able to update, and we want to be able to delete. And we've seen this um, before where we can actually go and we can say use. It ends up creating the database, and we can insert it to it. And here we're inserting these uh, four uh, fields with these values. Again, it's an associated array that's going to end up getting inserted into the database. So when we end up going to find uh, our data from the database, you'll notice that by default, there's this underscore ID, which is in fact, it feels like a string, it kind of behaves like a string, but it's actually an object. Um, and that ends up getting generated automatically. So you don't end up generating those, Mongo creates these object IDs, and there are other, you know, if you want to basically have like an integer column instead, you could end up doing that, but there are plugins that you could use to get that same result. But by default, you're basically going to have this um, this uh, GUID that ends up getting created that identifies the data as being unique. So when you go to update data, so what's going to happen here, the way that this is really working is that your first object here is going to be your query object, and your second object here is going to be what you end up pretty much replacing it with, okay? That takes that old object, again, you're going to have, it's not like you're going to have a new ID that's generated, but you're going to have that same ID and it's going to get replaced with this. You also see, really for the first time, that you have the ability to add a collection, right? A collection is a valid, um, you could use this key with this collection, so now you're basically embedded this collection of strings into your document. When we end up doing this um, uh, wiki stack exercise, we're going to embed a list of tags into our, um, uh, into our document. So there's other ways to do this. If you don't want to just replace the object, what you can do is you can specify, hey, look, find it, but I want to use the set operation. Well, what do you want to set? I want to end up setting my favorite movie prop properties with this value. So again, if you have a huge collection, you don't have to repeat all the yield in that document. By the way, if there was two users with the username uh, David, both of those would end up getting updated. When you want to delete something, you could delete it based on the ID. So if you specify this is the ID, 
And yeah, so I guess here, the, the object ID, this is actually a method which gives you the object ID type. Uh, and you can play around with that when you end up going into the Mongo tree, remove it with the ID. It's got to be put in that object ID. Maybe it does. And sometimes the versions of Mongo end up, end up changing as well. So this is all an example of aggregation, right? If you wanted to basically count the users, so you could do a find, and then you could end up doing a count. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the aggregation operators. There's a bunch of query operators that you have. So you could find out if something is in a range. You could find out if um, uh, you're, you know, let's say there's a collection of tags. You could find out if one of your tags is in this collection of tags. We're going to end up doing that for the, for the workshop, right? We showed you the greater than operator already. Uh, you can also end up using regular expressions, and you can also use JavaScript functions, although I've never done it with Mongo. There might be some way of querying with, with, uh, with functions themselves. Indexes are, you know, the same as you've, ended, as you, as you've seen before. So they're indexing, like we ended up creating our own index with um, the, uh, when we were looking at the FQL example. Um, so you have the ability if there's if you're going to be searching on specific fields, if you want it to be faster, you can end up indexing those fields. <coughs> there's some tools that you can end up that you could use. Uh, so one of these is RoboMongo, where you could again instead of actually using the command line to query your collections, you could have an IDE uh, that lets you use them. I've sort of gotten used to not using IDEs, so I haven't used any of these. But I think that there is uh, something that you might want to take a look at. So now let's talk about uh, Mongoose. So Mongo is pretty much the Wild West. Do whatever you want to with Mongo. Mongoose is a wrapper that allows us. It's kind of funny. Mongoose is a wrapper. M Mongoose is a wrapper that ends up wrapping around Mongo. And what it does is it gives you a structure that you, Mongoose is an NPM package. And the only thing that you have to tell Mongoose is, hey, look, here's, you know, same with SQLize. Here's the connection string to interact with, with Mongoose. Um, and what it provides you is that it gives you the ability to, um, to add uh, schemas. So you could specify, hey, look, here's my model. Here's my user model. The user is going to have a name. The user is going to have a date of birth. The type for the name is going to be a string. The type for the date of birth is going to be a date. You could end up putting hooks on it so that if you attempt to, it's going to look exactly the same, almost exactly the same as those SQLize when we say the big model, right? So you could end up creating these models, and that's your entree into a mongoose collection. And we'll talk about how you can sort of connect these objects together uh, as well. So if we think about the fact that um, in, in Mongo, we have these collections and documents, right? Mongoose gives us the ability to take a schema, okay? We create a schema, which looks very similar to the schemas we created with SQLize. Um, and we end up defining our models very similar to what we ended up doing with SQLize as well. So now you have the schema that gives you the model, and the model, right, big M for model, uppercase user I. In our case, when we do the, um, the wiki stack, we're going to have user objects and we're going to have pages. So uppercase user, uppercase page, this is just by convention. Right, and this gives you entree into the collection, and then you get your documents would be your little users and your little pages, sort of instances of this model. Um, so the sort of basics of Mongoose is that you have this schema, which is the blueprint for your object, right? It specifies what you want your, uh, what you want your instances of your objects to look like, and there are different things you can do. So you can have hooks like a pre-save hook that maybe you want to auto-populate something. That's something that we're going to end up doing. You can add methods to your objects. 
you could add virtuals to your objects that look like methods. They look like properties of the object that be computed. Um, and so there's methods that we could add on the big model, and there are methods that we could add on the instances of the models as well. These are all things that you'll end up uh, doing in the workshop. So you can end up using this uh, big model to, to create and find instances. And when you end up getting the individual documents of these instances, you're going to want to either save them or update them and delete them. And the fact that they ended up coming from a collection, right, and Mongoose knows where they came from, you can end up updating them and inserting them and deleting them. Again, same exact stuff that we ended up seeing with SQLize. So the way that that ends up looking in code is that we end up installing Mongoose, we end up requiring Mongoose. Um, here there's this Mongoose schema object, which is a constructor, and you can end up creating a new schema. Again, almost looks exactly the same as what you would have seen in SQLize, but instead of actually specifying types like SQLize string, you just basically use the JavaScript types, <clears throat> string, string. This is saying that here you have comments which are a collection. So each of the comments in your comment collection are going to have this structure. Right, and again, if you were doing database design or you write a lot of SQL, the idea of doing this sort of thing is, is kind of foreign. Right? You would set this up and have another table for, uh, for comments, and you'd have a blog table, and you'd have a comments table where the comments table has a, an ID that goes back to the blog. But in Mongo, it's fairly common, based on what the sizes are, to embed these things, depending on how you end up, how you end up using them. We'll talk about that in a little bit, too. So there's also ways that you could go in here. And what this ends up doing is that if you end up creating a, uh, a new object, right, it gives you some default values. There's also ways to specify whether it's required uh, and all kinds of ways that you can basically say, hey, look, this is what's going to make a valid field for this object. Now, we don't have our model yet. We've got our schema. Then building the model from the schema is pretty simple. And again, it's the same thing as... Um, it's actually kind of cool in a way. Your, your, your uh, model is singular, and here's your schema. I mean, it really does look exactly like SQLize. I mean, it's kind of cool. Someone had asked if they did how the pluralization works, but if you actually were to create a model called person, it's smart enough to create a collection called people, which is kind of cool. You have the ability to control that, too, if you want to, want to do that. But right now, pluralize is what you're what your model is. It's not going to do anything until you end up going in. There's no like, well, can you sync it, you know, to create it? No need, right? Because there's basically these things are going to end up just being shoved into a collection. What would it, what would it initialize? There's no schema on the Mongo level, right? This is all happening above. You could totally screw this thing up by going into Mongo directly and totally go against this schema. You have the ability to do that. That's a big difference between a, a relational thing. <laughs> So, a model in Mongo is not the same thing as a collection in Mongo. No, um, and, and this is very, very important, okay? A model, the way that I would say it is that the same way that a, again, a model in SQLize, I would call those models too, a model in SQLize gives you entree to a database table, a model in Mongoose gives you entree, gives you access to a Mongo collection. Does that, does that make sense? So you're using this object to get access to the underlying Mongo collection. And by the way, there are tools to interact with Mongo directly in Node, right? There is a, probably a Mongo NPM installed Mongo where you can end up interacting with, with Mongo. Um, so you could do that, but this is the idea of adding a little bit of structure around your, uh, your collections or your collections and how the collections are related to each other. So in terms of, you know, once you do that, we could talk about once you have this big model, so blog with a capital B is a big model, and here we create an instance of it. Creating an instance of it does nothing until you end up saving it. Okay? 
and this is actually a little bit different with SQLize. I don't think SQLize allows you, when you have those models in SQLize, I don't think you can say new user. I think you have to say user create, and you have to give it an object. So here you save it. Sorry, Eric. Eric, sorry. Um, so are you saying when you create the schema, it's just a, like, it's a bit of metadata that is used by Mongoose to control access to your yeah, questions? I don't even know. Yeah, I, and I would say, I don't even know if I, I don't know what, I don't know if I call it metadata. I would say that it's, it's uh, Mongoose is going to use it. When you interact with those underlying collections, yeah. Mongoose is going to use it as a set of rules. So it's not like it's not stored in Mongo or anything like it. Like I said, you can always go in and, and manipulate the database however you want to through the Mongo shell. Yeah, so in other words, like if you use Mongoose to set this up and you're all happy, happy, and the customer says somebody else is handling it now, turn over the Mongo DB, they can use it, read it, do whatever they want, and all the information is in there, even if they don't have the Mongoose um, schema. Yeah. yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so here, this is actually, you know, I, I think as we, these, some of these slides are being put together, Mongoose has changed a little bit. You're seeing this is sort of the old callback way, right? Again, because this is asynchronous, okay? When you, in any time there's any sort of I.O., if it's not asynchronous, there's something wrong with it, okay? You don't want to sit there and tie up your process as you're, as you're reading data. But here, when we go to save, we've got this callback function, okay? And this callback function, first parameter is the error, the second parameter is the object that's being saved. Okay? So this is where you would, you don't know the ID up here, but you get the ID over here. Mongoose also has a promise syntax. And I think, that, again, this is some, something that within the past year has changed. So you can end up saying my blog.save then, or you can end up catching exceptions. But you know, you'll, you'll experiment with that a little bit. In the same way, you have a find here. And this on its own wouldn't make really a lot of sense. You'd want to do a find and either put a callback in there to do the callback syntax or do it then to find that object. So Mongoose lives inside the node process, right? And it knows how to communicate with Mongo. It's your entree into a Mongo database. So in terms of how things end up getting joined, we spoke about this a little bit. Um, so Mongo is not relational. There's no support for any sort of joins uh, whatsoever. But there, there are two different ways that um, you can end up storing relations. You can either embed them, or you can end up linking them. Um, so there's two different ways to do this. So when, when we end up thinking about SQL and joins, a big part of it is that one of the reasons why we do these joins is that we don't want to have, um, we want our data to be normalized, meaning that, you know, if I give you that example of a product and a category, right, there's nothing that would prevent, when we want to find out the, the category name of a product, right, we do the join, with the category ID of the product table to the category table, and we end up getting the category name. There's nothing that would prevent us in SQL <laughs> database putting a column on our product ta table called category name. Right? We could do that. We'd say, hey, man, great. You know, we're saving a join here. You know, terrific, right? Except if someone goes and actually updates the category table, and they forget to go and update all those related category names in the product table, then you have this data that is, again, you've sort of messed up the integrity of your database. So what we're sort of used to with, um, with databases is to have normalized data, although, look, there are cases that you could make to not have normalized data. We took take the example of our tweets, our users and our tweets. If it turned out that we wanted to just have a count of how many tweets a user had, okay, again, we could go and do a join and do a count. But if for whatever reason that join becomes expensive, we can be a little bit redundant and we can say, hey, look, we're going to put a count column in our um, uh, uh, users table.
for the number of tweets and just make sure we update that when a user ends up. And th there are cases that you could make to say, hey, look, yeah, we know, breaks the rule, right? It's all of a sudden, it's not totally normalized, but we're willing to live with it based upon efficiency. It's almost like Mongo really uh, totally wants you to be able to do this because it's so easy to, to embed things in here. So even though there are some databases that do have support for columns behaving like JSON data, I know Postgres has the idea we could have a column that basically is, is JSON data. And I think these surprised if other databases have it as well. Here it's really simple where you basically say, look, here's my schema. And my uh, blog schema is going to be made up of comments. And so that each, this is an <laughs> example of embedding a collection inside of you, right? Which is fine for this sort of thing. And if you're always sort of coming at it from the blog <laughs> itself, and you're going to, your entry point is always the blog, then again, it's a very sort of quick operation to get these comments. But if there was some idea where a comment had a user ID that was associated with them, and you wanted to get all the comments that a particular user had written, well, it's going to be a bit of a drag, right? I mean, you're going to have to look at every single entry, every single document in that blog's collection, and you're going to have to go through every single comment and say, hey, look, I got to loop over, I got to, within this comments collection, I got to find the comment by the user. So, you have a speed advantage here, okay? But again, you have a disadvantage. In this case, it doesn't really matter. I mean, these are just strings and, and dates. Although, again, you could make the case, if I wanted to get the last five comments over all of my blogs, right, I've got a bit of an issue uh, getting it. Again, you could do it. It's just not going to be that fast. So um, here we've got a another way that we could do this. This does the exact same thing is that we can say, look, here's a schema for comments, and I'm going to store these comments as a comment schema. So this basically just allows us to separate our schemas out. Um, but this is the, gives you the exact, exact same thing. Right? There's only, in our case, there's only going to be one collection. Assuming we do this blogs model, we only create one model. It's going to be the blogs model, but we actually have two different schemas. Retrieval? Say one more time. Well, no, I'm seeing the square brackets for comments, so is, is that coincidence, or is that also going to be treated like an array? No, so what, so what you're saying here is that the way that this ends up reading with the schema is it says that um, I'm going to have embedded in this comments field a collection of objects, and each object in the collection is going to conform to this schema. Right? Here I'm just breaking it out, pulling that schema out separately. So those brackets indicate that it's, and, and by the way, I'm not even sure. I think <coughs> this is being done as a, uh, I'm not even sure if you had like the schema for one item, whether Mongo's lets you do that. So let's say there was something called a blog schema, I don't know, metadata schema or something like that. If it allows you to say, hey, look, this meta property is a metadata schema. I'm not even sure it lets you do that. Because I, I remember doing something from one of our workshops where there was, we sort of had to put it in an array, even though it didn't really make a lot of sense for it to be in an array. So you're saying it's a collection. Is that an interchangeable array? Or it's it an array. It's, it's an array. It's an array. Yeah. Think about it as an, as an array. Um, so the other thing that you could do is that if we wanted to store this uh, in two separate collections, we could do it. And the way that this is done is that it's kind of an interesting thing that you could specify, hey, look, you have a, there's a collection of comments that are associated with this, um, with a blog entry, okay? But the only thing really that's stored is the object ID. It's a foreign key. That's exactly what you're doing. It's a foreign key. But there's nothing at the database at the database level that does this. This is all mongoose wrapping around. This is very important here. When you say refers to comment, it's going to look for a mongoose model, okay, called comment. So that 
What this gives you, one of the things you also have the ability to do is that when you end up the same way that we do an include, you can also say, hey, look, find me the blog with this ID and populate the comments, okay? In, in Mongoose, they call it populating a path. But in essence, really, it's doing, however it's working under the covers, right, it's doing some form of a join to get that data. Um, and again, this is not Mongo, this is Mongoose. So you have the difference between actually going in and embedding something, right, as opposed to referencing it, which we're doing here, where you have this, this object ID. But again, it's not, you know, you could go into the database and do whatever you want to. There's nothing at the database level that says this is a foreign key. You get access to the database, you can do whatever you want to. If uh, something's embedded, can, can you put an index on an embedded field? A field within an embedded object? Or a collection, whatever term you want to use? Like uh, comments not date, let's say. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's a good question. I'm not sure the answer to it. Um, and so another thing we could sort of, and some of this actually, you can think about is some, you can think about regular database design as well, not just looking at Mongo. I mean, you have different, um, you have cardinality of objects. So you either have, you know, a one-to-one, -one, you have a many, a one-to-many, and sometimes you have a many-to-many. -many. So let's just talk a little bit about what that really means. So some, um, if you, if you had a one-to-one -one relationship, so you have this user collection, and within the user collection, you have one user profile, it sort of makes sense, you know, why have to go and do that with, it, with an object ID? It doesn't really end up buying you that much. Usually, you end up embedding that. Although, I don't know exactly why you have a one-to-one, -one, but it sort of makes us, makes sense to just get it all in one shot. There's no... There's no normalization issues that are going on there. So that kind of makes sense. Um, so in terms of how these things end up uh, getting set up, the, the, so some of the rules that you have here is that if you just have one to a few, so one of the ones to sort of think about is that our movies, let's say we were storing genres for our movies, right? And a movie going to be multiple genres, let's say, all in different multiple categories. The idea there is to... Embedding, okay? Um, so, or something like addresses, where someone's not going to have a ton of addresses. Um, or, you know, uh, the categories of a blog post, which, again, might be very similar to the genres of a movie. So, the idea is, hey, if it's just a couple of things, just put it in, embed it in the, uh, in the object. Although, I could really make the case of... Um, you know, if you ended up embedding the genres with your strings inside of the movie object, then if you did want to get all the movies with a particular genre, you know, there is a, a cost to that at this point, right? As opposed to, you know, setting that, something like that up as sort of a many-to-many -many relationship, which really, in essence, in that case, it really would be, right? Um, I mean, categories, too. I mean, if you think about categories on, on a post, you could think that, you know, look, maybe the idea if I'm naming this category and I'm having it on a post so that, you know, a post can have many different uh, categories and a category could belong to, same category could belong to a lot of posts. You could sort of think about at some point, hey, look, I changed the name of that category. Well, what do I, how do I fix that? I got to go inside every single post and modify that. So again, there's a trade-off between the speed and you know how much you want to end up normalizing something. So say if, as an example, how would you handle say um, tags? And, you know, that's that's kind of a one to many, not one to not so many. Somebody might put five, six tags on one. But it's a, a very common search to search by tags. I know so I, look, I, I you know I think that there look I think someone would in that case I think say you know, maybe as a first shot, they would say, let me just embed this as a first shot. I and mean, you can fairly easily, you can query, you know, Mongo uh, does have those operators where you can say, hey, look, here's this embedded collection. If any of the tags that I'm putting in are inside of 
any of the tags of this object, I want to return it. So you can you still have the ability to search the search bar. So there's also this idea, and this is also similar to you know when we looked at when we were look, you know, in, in our case with our I mean, I, I think you could sort of make the case, you know, who ends up getting the reference, right? If you, you have your tweets and your users, right, your reference ends up going on your tweets. Your reference ends up going on the many. Again, the, the biggest uh, one that you run into that gets to be more confusing, and it is totally supported, by the way, with SQLize, which we didn't look at, is the idea of having a many-to-many -many relationship. Uh, again, sort of one a common one for that is a user having multiple roles in an application. And usually, the way that you end up doing this, any anything that's relational, is you end up having a user table, you have a role table, and you end up having a user roles table. Um, so, you know, here the idea of having this sort of many to me, I think when you have this many to many relationship. If you are going to end up doing a many-to-many -many relationship without having some sort of many-to-many -many table, you do have this idea of keeping these collections in sync. Again, if you only end up going through one way, then it's not really a problem. So in other words, if you said, hey, look, a user is going to have multiple roles, and you're going to embed the, you know, even if you did this based on an object ID that corresponded to a role table, okay? You could end up doing that, and that works out okay. But if you did want to go the other way around, and you wanted to find all the users that were in a particular role, right? It's going to be kind of problematic. You know, you can imagine this huge collection of object IDs that would be inside this. Looking at your application, you're like, all right, this is pretty good, but uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna switch to a SQL database, which helps me make these <laughs> these decisions a little bit easier. At least that's what they did at the company that I was at. So, um, you know, you, you could think about we covered uh, some of this stuff where the idea of you know how these this stuff would end up getting translated to a Mongoose database. You know, it went by some of those rules. Maybe you have a movies. Collection and you know if a movie only has a couple of directors, maybe you end up embedding the directors. Um, but even this with this small number of tables, I, I would really I think I'd go a little bit nuts uh, turning this into Mongo. Just thinking about where do I want to come from the data? If I want to start actually now having a director and list all the movies of a particular director, then do I have a movies collection under embedded under director? And then under movies, do I have a director collection embedded under there, right? Or do I store them as, you know, object IDs? In which case, it's still a collection. I've got to make sure they're synced correctly. So if I end up adding a new director to a uh, to a movie, right? I've also got to go and find that director and add that movie underneath his collection as well. So. Again, if you're just coming in through movies, it makes life a lot easier to make those make those decisions. So, in this example, and this couldn't be easier really to install uh, uh, MongoDB. Uh, you can end up you can do this, and um, you can install it. We'll, I have the workshops open. I'll set up the pairs, but this is uh, going to be a little bit more complex of a web application than we ended up. Uh, doing before the routes are going to be a little bit, little bit more complex, but we're sort of building a mini Wikipedia where you can end up creating pages. We're also going to experiment with text fields where we can render that text fields as uh, markup, which is uh, kind of interesting. So we'll look at the idea of creating our own filters with Swig. So all these templating engines have the ability to sort of create these snippets of code, and we're going to be using Swig to do that. Um, but the idea that we're going to have both users and we're going to have pages, which is not that dissimilar that, from what we did before, but also that our pages are going to end up having tags, so we're going to be able to get similar pages and that sort of thing. So um, you know, even though we're going to be using uh, Mongo uh, to do it, 
um, there's probably more time that you're going to spend around the express uh, part of things. So let me actually stop recording this. I will save that link up. Let me set up your...